Hope you're doing well today. You ever had one of those mornings and it's like, just what happened? <laughs> that was mine today. Those people in the midst of, in the, w w I forgot to fill the baptistry yesterday. But it's, it's got plenty of water now. It's just going to feel more like the Nile River, okay? A little bit, <laughs> little bit chilly. But hey, it only hurts in the belly. The, everything else is fine. So um, I'm very thankful for that. Uh, some of you might be thinking to yourself, gosh, why is Heidi up here too? And uh, the truth is, is that w w w our message today has everything about hope. And, uh, you know, one of the incredible things about watching a child learn how to walk is, as parents, we have so much hope that we put them right back up after they fall, don't we? Because we want to, we, we want them to be successful, don't we? And, and it's like, come on. And, and what are we, we're so excited, we go and get the camera, huh? And we're so excited, we're, we're taking videos of this, and it's like, they don't even know what's going on. They just know that they're the star of the show there for a minute or two. And I want you to know that, that uh, hoping for the future is, about, is, is really kind of about this morning's message. And, um, and the reason why Heidi's up here with me is because as, uh, as we delve into this idea of hope, um, hope starts when that child is conceived. Because so many planned on that. Uh, hope, hope, hope blossoms again as that child is birthed. And, and hope, hope uh, gains some, some momentum. And it gains momentum as we uh, see that child maybe learn how to pray. And, and it's a developmental process. And yet there's others in this room right here, others that are online that can understand this. I never had that hope. Didn't come from a Christian home. Well, today is a great day to start having hope because Jesus Christ transforms our lives. And um, anyway, you're going to hear uh, it, it, out in the display, there's a, there, there's a new display out there. We're still waiting for some of the letters to come in. And, and it's really about something called hope at home. We don't think that anybody should be without hope, regardless of their circumstance in life. No circumstance is without hope because Jesus Christ died for all. And Jesus Christ provides in us and through us an everlasting hope. And um, we just want to emphasize the fact that this is from the cradle to the grave, okay? As John mentioned, uh, a lot of times when children are trying to walk, we try to catch them and pick them back up. But falling is a part of the process. If we don't let them fall, they're never going to do it because if you just hold them the whole time, they're actually not walking on their own. So we are trying to provide hope. And for a child, getting back up, uh, getting back up is that hope and trying again. Uh, a lot of times in America, we misuse the word hope. It's I hope so. I hope this is going to happen. But we have a solid hope that is found in Jesus Christ. You know, uh, parents, have a, parents have this incredible hope that their child is going to be somebody incredible. I, I want you to know that uh, as, uh, this is my daughter, in case you didn't know that, okay? Some of you are like, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Um, isn't she lucky? Um, <laughs> you're supposed to say amen, not laugh. <laughs> that um, I, I, I want you to know that uh, um, our children, our daughters were raised intentionally. Um, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't just some figment of our imagination that, that Christ was going to become a part of their life. It, it, it was a part of their life. I, I, want to, uh, I, want to, um, I want to invite you to a picture of uh, what night was like putting our two daughters to bed. Okay? We usually sang about uh, seven or eight songs. Some of them were funny as can be, and some of them about the, uh, about the work of God, about loving God, about having an admiration of who God was. And then we would go through the alphabet, starting with the letter A, and some nights we would talk about words that described what God had done, and they were pretty good at that, and sometimes the C and the K got mixed up because their language skills weren't there, and sometimes we just mentioned names of God. Every night we had this thought, uh, and, and, uh, and, and some guys were over one night, and we were playing a g game called Risk, and I said, hey, I'm going to put my daughter to daughters to bed, I'll be, I'll be back in about 15 minutes, and they go, 15 minutes? 
They go, how long, does it, how long does it take to say your prayers? I said, in our house, 15 minutes. And they came and watched through the bedroom window. They go, John, man, this is like entertainment central. You got, you, what are you doing in their lives? I said, I'm creating a culture of faith that's a part of our, that's a part of our family. And um, why do I say that? Because uh, hope was not something that we, I hope so, took place. It was something that we were going to help create. And um, many of you uh, maybe can relate to what's gone on because you've done some of those same things. And some people have worked really hard at this and, and your kids have not chosen to follow the Lord. But I, but I would just add this one little thought in. Was our goal for them to be churched or was our goal for them to be in love with Jesus Christ? Our hope as believers is found in the Lord Jesus Christ, because greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. So we have this incredible hope and anticipation because we know that that is solid. It is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not found in an inanimate object. It is solid and it is true. Um, and as a believer, I know that I am not alone. I will never be alone because I can always cling to the hope of Jesus Christ. You know, hope at home is the name of this, and I want you to know that we often have life circumstances where we don't know if people have hope or not. Uh, what happens when your kids go prodigal? What do you do? Here's a little resource. Maybe you have a friend. Maybe you're going through this yourself. My, my son's going prodigal. My daughter's going prodigal. Here's a, basically just a little, ex, a little explanation about what it is that you're going through and a variety of resources. Maybe you're going, man, I'm, man, how do I have an influence in my grandchildren? That's another stage of life that people are in. Or, or how do I care about an aging loved one? Um, and and each, one of these, each one of these has uh, some information to help you identify and, 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 and the back has some resources for you to begin to look at, which, which might help you. Why? Because sometimes we do better just helping somebody classify something with us, helping somebody understand. And anyway, these are, uh, these are called pointers. And uh, there's a whole bunch of them that are in the back. You know, since, uh, since Jesus Christ never changes, our hope is in him. I uh, want to share several verses with you that might, might help declare to you a better understanding of what we're talking about here. Um, Colossians 3, 2 says this, set your affections on things up above, not on the things of the earth. There's a call for us to not, to, to not love my stuff as much as I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And for that to be our goal for pointing people towards the affections of Jesus Christ, which last forever. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Um, our priorities dictate our resources of our time and money. So we need to be very conscious of what we are putting our love into. There's an element of hope that, uh, that Jesus Christ is, is, is abundantly bigger than anything else in all the world. In, in Matthew 28, 19, it says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, um, we, We've not been called to simply be somebody's friend. We've been called to be a living example of Jesus Christ. I love what Tom said earlier, and this was not planned at all. I just go, gosh, Tom just made a great point. You know what? Um, it's, it's, it, it's my joy and my opportunity to provide some hope. Um, but sometimes that means journeying with somebody for a little while. Because, because to make them a disciple, it's not just to have them be happy it's to help them have their life be transformed by Jesus Christ because he can do something in us that we can't do in ourselves. As it says in Psalms 1, blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water. They get such great joy and blessing from delighting in the Lord. It's not a fluke. It's not an accident that the tree was planted there. It was something that was purposeful. Has anybody accidentally ever made a cell phone? maybe a cell phone call, but you haven't accidentally created a cell phone. You haven't accidentally created a wedding cake. There is purposeful intention that went into that. That's part of being proactive with scripture. And what I mean by proactive with scripture is this. Um, I, I hear a verse and I proclaim it because I believe in the truth of it. I believe in the promise of it. I believe in the future results of what that is. 
And sometimes I want to put my own angle on that. So let me give you an understanding. Most of the people in this service probably remember pre-GPS days. Okay? They were called maps. <laughs> Some of you, the only thing you know about a map is, is that if you stuck it in the window, it was a shade structure before they had tinted windows, right? Okay, well, there was, there was with one other way. I, my mom couldn't read a map. I, I won't go there, okay? I'll just, she didn't know how to read a map. And, and I'm like, I, I didn't understand that. But, but GPS, um, this is what we used to do. We used to say to somebody, this, this is Pat right here in the second row here. Was, hey, Pat, just follow me, okay? And, 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 and so we're going to go. I'm going to show him how to get to this place. All he's got to do is follow my car. But what happens on the way there? A car gets in between ours, right? And then, and then at the next stop sign, another one does. And then I hit the green light, and he hits the yellow light. And he's a polite driver, unlike me. And so he pauses. And now he's got... 14 cars in back of me, and he starts following the wrong car, and he ends out some other street. Why? Because his GPS was on something that it wasn't intended to be. And, and the map of Jesus Christ says, therefore, go and make disciples. The map of Jesus Christ says, hey, set your affections on the things up above, not on the things of the earth. The, the, the scriptures point to, hey, be a tree planted by the water. Why? That's where the strongest trees are because they never lack nourishment. So in our journey of faith, we have a variety of different roles that we get to have an impact on other people's. Some of these roles are as a child of the king, we have first and foremost the joy of spreading that hope with others. Uh, maybe you're a parent and you get to share that hope with your children. Uh, we all have friends, so we get to share that with our friends. Uh, if you're married, you have a spouse that you get to share that with. An employer or an employee, you have that working relationship that you get to share that with. And also your neighbors, whoever lives next to you getting to share that with them you know as a uh, as a spouse I make investments um, I'm going to use an example from a poker game okay um, in, 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 in poker you have a certain number of chips right and and uh, sometimes with your spouse you spend them accidentally anybody ever done that and then in trying to make up for it you spend even more because you're a, a bigger dork than you were before that and and before you know it you're out of chips and, and the truth is, is that one of our great needs in life is, is to develop chips so that, when, so, that we've, so that when we've expended them, there's still some there, that we're replenishing ourselves. That's why a, a daily time with the Lord is so important. That's why, that's why we learn the idea of being proactive rather than just um, what I call expending and expending and expending. There's something important. That's, what, that's why church is an important place to be. That's why daily devotions and spending time with the Lord is so important because those things build our hope. Those things build our strength. Those things allow us to be successful in the idea of providing hope to other people. Not because we're somebody magical, it's just that we understand the deep journey that they're on. And sometimes as we're thinking about those different roles that we play, we kind of run out of ideas. I don't know about you, but sometimes my husband and I are like, hey, let's do a date. Well, okay, let's see. What do we want to do? So a great another aspect of this program is something called idea cards. And there are marriage date night ideas. There are idea cards for spending intentional time with young children, for older children. Great ideas of, hey, let's put on a movie. But instead of just watching a movie afterwards, let's have a conversation about what the movie was about. What is the underlying influences that is taking place in that movie? So ways to add intentionality to our day-to-day -day life because when we're being intentional things are going to grow and develop um let me give you a little contrast to my own my own story i i i grew up here in stockton and lived here my whole life uh and and in the process in the process of growing up i i went to church but i didn't embrace church okay i, I didn't hate going there okay um i just thought that when they passed that food around for the last supper it was a pretty small meal um, you know, those little cups don't do much satisfying, and they need to make them bigger and thirsty two ounces. It needs to be Dr. Pepper, not grape juice that was spoiled. Um, and, 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 and those little crackers needed to be full sandwiches. I, I, I just, I didn't embrace any of it because I didn't understand it. And, and the truth is, I believe that the gospel was being shared there. I just was too ADD. I, I could tell you how many light bulbs were in the building. I could. 
I could tell you how many letter B's there were in the bullets in that week. I could tell you how many G's there were because I took turns filling in all the bubble letters and I would count them because I needed something to do to keep me. But at 17 years old, um, a light went on in my head and a switch took place in my heart where Jesus Christ was the most important thing in the world. And I'm one of those people who when I came to Christ, I knew just enough to realize this. This is not simply a ticket to heaven to avoid hell. This is about being absolutely in love with and adoring who Jesus Christ is and desiring to be a servant of his for the rest of my life. Um, that's my story. Uh, and, and the reason why I share that with you is because uh, I heard regularly this phrase in our home. You got to give God an hour a week. That didn't make sense to me. But when I hit about, when I, after I'd been a believer for about five years, I go, that's one of the worst things that I could have ever been taught, giving God an hour a week. It doesn't work that way. It's about my whole life. So going, growing up, uh, I had the joy of being able to go to church every Sunday. It wasn't a, are we going? It was, hey, this is what we're doing. And it wasn't ever a fight. I was so excited to put my church clothes on and to get ready. And going to church involved going to being there for multiple services, going to church, uh, being in Sunday school, and then also having the opportunity when I got older to be a cross-age tutor and serve and be with those kids. And during that time, I think of all the fond Sunday school teachers I had and just the love for the Lord that they have and how they shared that with us, whether that was through memorizing verses, uh, singing songs together, doing different Bible stories. The Bible became alive because these teachers were so interactive and so engaged in us. And it was more than just Sunday mornings on Sunday evenings. Um, I had kids, uh, kids choir that I was a part of. It's kind of surprising that I would sing, um, but I sang very quietly so people couldn't hear. But I just enjoyed being at church and being there around fellow believers and just the influence of people in my life helped me to capture that I needed a savior. It wasn't something that I could do on my own. I realized I needed hope and that hope could only be found in Jesus Christ. So as a very young child, I had the opportunity to give my life to the Lord. You know, mentors have been a big part of uh, my life. And um, when I say that, I don't take that lightly because there's some people who took an interest in me. It was an interest in me spiritually. There's a, uh, there's a guy who I met with for five years. Every Friday morning, we had breakfast. And about three years into that, I started to meet with a guy for about three and a half years, and, 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 and we walked through the scriptures. We walked through the key elements of faith, which were things like, what is it that you believe? Where is your trust? What about answered prayer? What about pray prayers that we don't think are answered? What about when you question your faith? And, and I've had that opportunity with several other people as well. Uh, mentoring was something that was intentional from that guy, but there's two other families. This one family just said to me, John, um, I know you grew up in a home that went to church, but, but Christ wasn't central to the family. I'd just like you to come over and have dinner with us every Wednesday for a year. I just want you to see what it's like to raise kids in a Christian family. Man, it was so different from our dinner table. My dinner table, growing up, hey, we had to stay there for eight to ten minutes. There's, they were there for like an hour and a half every night. I'm going, Whew. it's kind of different. I mean, I'm like, when do we get to go outside and play? Um, it, it, just, it was just very different. But these people mentored me and gave me an idea. And I think that mentoring is one of the most powerful things in the world because it's showing somebody and giving somebody hope. And it's developing a hope within them. I remember growing up, there was a family that we would go over to their house about every six to seven weeks, uh, and they had a son that was a few years older than us, but being over there and getting to have intentional family conversations uh, and just getting to be in the presence of believers, and that also really helped to shape my mind because I remember my parents being mentored, and the influence of that and seeing that modeled for me, when I got older, I realized I needed that same thing on my own. I needed older people to be influencing me and to help me walk through my life, so that was a huge, incredible role model that my parents chose to do in an incredible time. I remember going on vacations with that family and just thinking of all the fond memories and intentional times we spent with them to impact the spiritual walk of our lives. This is just a hilarious little note here. This, this guy's 11 years older than Heidi, and, who, and we went on a houseboat, and he brought a friend because he was an only child. And So we're there, and um, um, 
um, Heidi knew how to play the game Old Maid. And um, these guys had never played Old Maid before. They lost 27 times in a row. And, uh, and, the, little, and the little thing was is that if you lost, you had to go, we, we, it was a houseboat vacation. You had to go down the slide and get in the water and come back. And um, anyway, he kept get, I, I didn't know what was going on. I said, I said uh, Johnny, I said, I said well, why do you keep going on the slide? He goes, because your daughter's like the old maid queen of the world. He goes, I don't even understand how to play it, but I keep getting sent down the slide. He goes, this is not fair. He goes, you've taught your girls to be very competitive at games at a young child. I said, way to go, Heidi. <laughs> um, now, now wh why do I bring that up? Because, because this, this couple that we went with, that's the couple that, uh, that they just spent time with us. I remember asking them once, I said, uh, I said, you got any tips for us? And they said, John, they said, uh, uh, why, don't you, why don't you subscribe to a magazine from Focus on the Family? I know you don't like to read that much, but the articles are really short. Just keep building resources inside of you to pass on the faith. And then, they, then, then there was this other magazine. I, truthfully, I wish I could remember the name of it, but it was another Christian publication. He said, John, he says, I bought you a subscription for a year. And, and, and those two magazines were, were very instrumental in me just having ideas more than anything it was not just the ideas, it was the idea that I was being reminded that I needed to have a heart that said, I want my children to grow in their faith and to be developed in their faith. I don't think that either of my daughters ever heard this phrase growing up. I don't think they ever heard from me, what do you want to be when you grow up? The phrase I used in our home was, whose do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be like? When you grow up. Because we believed that development of character far outweighed all of the things about the success of life. As our, as our older daughter got uh, into college, she didn't really want to go to college. And my mom was hassling her. I said, Mom, if you, don't ever, if, you want my, if you want Christy to never come here ever again, just keep asking her. Just keep asking her when she's going back to school. She'll go back when she feels like it. Because to me, she's trying to honor God with her life. And right now, going to school is not very honoring because her heart is not in it. And she doesn't like it. And it's way beyond what she is. And I said, Mom, would you rather have our granddaughter who loved the Lord Jesus Christ with her whole heart and soul and mind? Or would you rather have somebody who was a successful business person cursing the name of God? That was not very easy to say to my mom. She apologized a couple years later, and she said, I, I, I can't believe your dreams have come true. You have daughters that love the Lord more than anything in all the world, and that this idea of important. So uh, let's, let's point out about three or four important things. Here. The, 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 in addition to the importance of mentors, is really the importance of the church, okay? And the importance of the church simply says this, from the cradle to the grave. If you're a grandparent, you drop a child off over here, our hope is that there's Christian music playing in the background and that, that, that they learn to love some of the phrases that are a part of Christian music. We want them to be hugged. We want them to be loved. Not, not to the point that they're falling in love with them, but that they understand this is a very loving place. We want you to trust what's happening there. Our goal starting at about two years old is for a simple Bible story to be read to them. And I want you to know that uh, I challenge you to find a better preschool Sunday school class than what Sandy Evans provides here for our kids. She is a champion. She loves presenting the word of God. She loves making it alive. She does that well. She engages. And the truth is, is that, the, that the church is important in those regards. Another important thing is for us is to provide materials. Why? Because everybody's at their own pace of life. The importance of material says this, we want to resource you because you're there all the time, but we're not necessarily there all the time. And that's such an important, important aspect. And we, want to support, and we want to support you by providing small groups to be a part of that you will never, ever lose hope as well. Um, a disciple is someone that is a master or a trainer or, of something. Uh, the job of the disciple is to learn the trade, to watch the master. And in Scripture, we have an incredible example of what that looks like with Jesus Christ. In Matthew 4, 19, it says, Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus laid this out incredibly. He didn't just say, oh, hey, go do this. He said, hey, John, come follow me. 
Now, I'm going to model it for you. I'm going to show you what I want you to do. Now, hey, come alongside me, and we're going to do it together. And then he says, hey, now you're prepared. Now you should go do it. So a disciple is a process. It doesn't just happen overnight, but Jesus calls us to be disciples. A believer is not something that is a passive. I get to sit back and watch. As a disciple, we have the joy to participate, to be active in this process, to work together. This incredible hope that is given to us, this is a journey that that we get to not just have in church, but we get to live it once we walk out of these doors and gets to be with us always. You know, when we speak about discipleship, this, is gonna, this may blow your mind. Do you know the word Christian is only in the Bible three times? In the New Testament, it's only there three times, and it wasn't there before Jesus Christ. The word disciple is there 269 times. Life transformation is way more important than the classification of I've chosen to follow Christ. A disciple and discipleship is what we're doing and what we've embraced. A Christian is a term that refers to somebody who's made a decision. That's why you will hear me say way more often the word believers, the word disciples. I have nothing against the word Presbyterian at all. But the word Presbyterian doesn't mean anything to a lot of people. The word disciple transforms every Bible-believing church. Um, sometimes, sometimes I hear people say this who are part of some denomination. They'll say something like, um, well, we believe, and I'm like, no, no stop there. If you're not going to say we believe what the Bible says, then just be quiet. <laughs> because... because, because um, I, I mean this in truth. This, this, this is way more important to me than what Eco says. But I, I agree with what Eco says, but I believe this a whole lot more. Because this is directly from the Lord. Incredible little thought. Throughout scripture, there's a lot of different verses that reference hope, and we're going to share some of those with you. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Philippians 1, 6 says this, for I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ, reemphasizing that idea of the cradle to the grave. Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Not just a little bit, it fills like a full glass. That is a lot of joy and peace that comes with the hope believing in Christ. Psalm 74 says th this, uh, as for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. Many people end up walking away from the hope of Jesus. Uh, there's different reasons that that happens. For some, it's they grow up and they simply lose interest in it. For others, they never truly embraced it. They kind of heard it, but didn't grab onto it and really go with it as they move forward with life. For some, a life circumstance changed their opinion of the Lord, and they could not come to terms with what was taking place. And simply, others, they want to enjoy their own way of thinking. They are enjoying the life of sin that they are living, and they do not want to turn away from that. As, uh, as somebody who's worked with youth for a, a, a lot of years, I, I remember hearing these kinds of phrases sometimes. A, a, a child might say something like, well, church stopped being fun, so I stopped. I don't think church ought to be boring, but, but the number one goal is not fun. The, the number one goal is transformation. Uh, sometimes an adult would say, I gave up on the church because they let me down. Uh, or, or somebody might say, uh, if you knew what my dad was really like, you wouldn't like God either. Because they had two different messages taking place in their life. Um, and these are people that are losing hope. And part of this, and I'm, I'm referring back to these again. Um, you know, each one of these is about a life situation where somebody has lost some hope. Just a great little tool. It's not shoving something down somebody's throat, just saying, you know, hey, I, I know you're going through a lot as you're, um, um, as you're taking care of your mom and dad as you're pastor. I just want to provide you with this. This one happens to say, aging loved one. What a, what a great little resource just to provide for them. 
The great thing is our spiritual journey and our journey of faith is not something that we do alone. It is a partnership. First and foremost, it's a partnership with God because that is who we are putting our hope in. There's also an incredible partnership with the church and the other believers that we have. And we ourselves are partnering with other people at that same time. In John 15, Jesus refers to himself as the vine um, and as believers, we are the branches. And if you've ever seen a grapevine, you can see that the root is really, really strong. And then you have all the vines growing out from it. That is an incredible picture of how strong the root is and how strong Jesus is and that we are coming out from that. Our strength doesn't come from ourselves. Our strength comes because we are rooted in Jesus Christ. And in the book of Jude, there are several responsibilities that are given to us as believers. The first is that we are to build ourselves up in holy faith, to continue to work on our faith and grow in our knowledge. The second is to pray, not just pray once, but to continually pray and give things up to the Lord. The third is to keep yourselves in the love of God. Always remember that that love comes from Christ. Be merciful to those who doubt and encourage others to have hope and to keep the hope. We're not to judge other people, but we can provide hope and provide resources and tools for people that are struggling to identify the hope that comes from Jesus. In the book of Deuteronomy, there's this thing called the Shema, and we've referred to it several times this last year. Um, and could you bring that slide up? And, and would you read this? With, this is a declaration, the first thing every Jewish boy learned as a child. First thing every Jewish girl did. And it's what they taught to their own children. They taught to their grandchildren. They taught to their great-grandchildren. This is the proclamation of, of what our responsibility is. Would you read it with me? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. You know, none of these are, the only guarantee that there is is that when Jesus Christ becomes a part of our life, we're secure forever. Um, everybody has the opportunity to make choices. And I think one of the hardest things about relating to people is, is that we're often giving advice based on our track record, <laughs> based on our abilities, based on our experiences, and we're passing on to somebody something that isn't necessarily taking their track record into place, their resources, but yet the resources of the scriptures are absolutely eternal. Um, um, so our church is here to help you on this, uh, on this journey and I want you to know that Satan is mean. He doesn't want us to be successful in this. And uh, he tries to discourage us and have us lose hope. We are each to have a journey of loving the Lord. We each have to have our own relationship with him. The truth of scripture needs to be deeply rooted in our lives. And we are to train our children in this so that they will also have that choice for the relationship with the Lord later. The journey of following Jesus is and should always be present. It's not just something that takes place once. It always gets to walk with us. And we believe that that hope never leaves. Uh, so, so I want to summarize all this with, with, with three simple thoughts. The first one is this. Um, hope should be taught to our kids and grandkids. It should be. Hope should be taught to them. Uh, we introduced you to something called a faith box and um, last week. And I want you to know that uh, last Sunday afternoon I had a great chance to be with uh, the ACES family. And, and uh, Jet's here this morning and, and, and uh, uh, her daughter... Um, Maya? I started, Maya? I started to pronounce it incorrectly. I paused. Ma Maya. Mia. 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 <laughs> Let's start over there. So I had the privilege to be at their house last week, and, 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 and we were talking. About, anyway, their name is Mia. And, no one, and, and there was a presentation of presenting their child before the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, a, a dedication and a, a confirmation, an idea of this. We want, we want her to grow up. And to find an absolute love and admiration for the Lord. That, that, that it's a decision that she's going to make someday. And, and so hopefully that faith box. We had a phone call in the office this week and somebody said, hey, can I buy one of those faith boxes? I want to give one to one of our friends. And you, you know what? It's, it's a simple journey that says this. Uh, are we praying? Are we documenting? Are we helping them find roadmaps 
Are we helping them find visual pictures or Polaroids in our mind that are simply saying this, my journey of faith is really, really important? Let me ask a question honestly. Anybody have a picture of a vacation ever? How come? Go ahead, say it out loud. How come? Because it's a memory. You ever have a picture of your child praying and show it to them later on? You ever had a picture of their first day of school? What about when they left for camp, church camp? What about when they arrived home from church camp? What about that moment of time when, as a family, we prayed at the Thanksgiving meal? What about those days when everybody used to get dressed up and moms used to make those dresses for their kids on Easter Sunday? I'm not saying that we should go back to always dressing up, that sort of thing. There's that element of what pictures are we giving them that are about their spiritual journey. That's the importance of this faith box. We don't ever want to miss that opportunity. And, and as grandparents, you may or may not have ever heard this before. A child will gravitate to the oldest person they know who they believe loves them more than anybody else in all the world. Can you capture that for a second? If your grandchild knows that you love them, they will, they will be listening and embracing your thoughts more than anybody else in all the world because God has given them something that is called perspective and they understand. Let me tell you what happened in our family. Uh, Bev used to work on Tuesdays and she was on call every Tuesday night. My mom and dad would ask us, my mom would pick up our girls from school on Tuesdays and, um, and we used to have dinner there. And um, uh, this is terrible, but it's the truth, okay? Um, my, my mom really didn't like cooking that much, okay? She just kind of threw stuff together. And um, Anyway, one day I, I realized that my girls weren't enjoying having dinner there. And, and so, I, so we developed this little code, and uh, I, 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 they would, they would, I would call them about the time that they would be picked up, because this daughter right here, she only says something once, okay? And so I knew that if I could hear it, then it wasn't going to be grandma and grandpa. I was going to get the chance here. And when we're on the phone, if they said UFO, that meant it was an unidentified food object for dinner. <laughs> and and, and that, ju that just meant that I was going to pass when we were asked. Why? They just didn't think it was very cool. <laughs> One day my dad says, John, what's a UFO? <laughs> I said, um, Dad, th that, means that, that means it's not one of their favorite things to eat. My mom's listening. She goes, what is their favorite things to eat? I said, um, my dad says, we're not going there. They got to learn to eat whatever's put in front of them. And I said, I said um, and my mom says, no, we're having what they want because they're eating here every Tuesday night. And all of a sudden, we started having kid-friendly food, and so we didn't have, I don't think we ever had a UFO again after that. And my dad cracked up one night. He was sitting there. We were, it was one of the last times that, uh, that they were in school to the point that they were picking up, and he goes, he just was laughing really loud. I go, what are you laughing about? He goes, I'm laughing about UFO. He goes, that's the dumbest thing you ever heard in the world. He goes, and he looked at my mom and says, Martha, you're a whole lot better grandma than I am grandpa because I think I would have chased them away because, because I do believe that they got to eat what they're supposed to eat, but mom and dad can take care of that. We can just be a little bit of a hero. And you know what? They were teaching my daughters that they were important. And uh, just this last week, our, 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 our oldest daughter says, and this is a compliment to somebody here in the room, said, Dad, do you know Beverly Fertig very well? And I said, yeah, I'm getting to. And she said, she's a mix of Grandma Hathorne and Grandma Burkle. So she said, said, one of the reasons why I love spending time with her and being mentored by her is because she's the best of both of them. Beverly, I say this, I, I use her name on purpose for this reason, because there's somebody who has chosen to invite my daughter into a mentoring relationship, and it means the world to her to be included. Um, and, and there's something about, I'm not calling you old, okay, by any means. Um, <laughs> But, 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 but her own grandma and grandpa aren't alive anymore, and so she gravitates towards those people that are mentors in those ways. Thank you for mentoring our daughter in that way. It's great when it's a two-way relationship. 
Um, another aspect of this is that even in challenging times, so these pointers, there's a lot of them that deal with challenging times. But there's a, a lot of them that are also helping us to be proactive when we are anticipating something to happen. And so throughout this, these things, they provide hope when it is hard to see the hope. When it seems like it's the light at the end of the tunnel, these can provide hope. But also at the same time, when we want to have a chance to celebrate hope, there's also resources for that. Because sometimes things happen to us and we have to react. And other times it is a choice that we're making and we get to um, work within that season of hope. Um, I think, I think one, of the, one of the things that uh, we miss often is really this third thing and it's, and it's really this. Uh, it's, it's building up reserves. Uh, and when I say building up reserves, many of you have probably heard this phrase that if, if you're married, regardless of how long you've been married, you should keep dating your spouse. Now, now what, what in the world does that mean? That means the, 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 the relationship is going to remain status quo without taking a chance to invest something else. I, uh, uh, I, I love the idea of just building something here. So there's this one, here's this, here's this little idea card. I'm just going to read this to you. It says, young children, one of a kind, use a family cooking activity, nutritional value, and intentional time to talk about how God has made each of us unique and special for his glory. Here's some advanced preparation. Get one index card per person and write the name of a family member across the top of each one. Purchase and gather ingredients listed below. Individual pizza crusts for each person in your family so that you can make your own or use store-bought crusts. Get some tomato sauce, some shredded mozzarella cheese, some toppings like pepperoni, peppers, mushrooms, pineapple, sausage, etc. Okay? Serve it up. Say something like this. God made each one of us unique and special, and we're going to have fun creating our very own pizzas tonight. Preheat the oven to 400 degrees and then put pizza crust on cookie sheets and lay out all the ingredients in small bowls. You can pick, say this, you can pick and choose what you'd like to put on your pizza today. Each pizza will be different. You can make funny faces or use toppings to spell out your initials. Then, then it says do again. Once your pizza have been decorated, place them in the oven for approximate cooking time of 10 minutes and follow the recommended cooking instructions if it's a store-bought crust. And then it says to discuss, and it says, while your pizzas are baking, use the time to talk about how different each pizza turned out. In the same way, God has created each one of us different and with various talents. We have different color hair and eyes. We have different talents and gifts. He made each one of us different. And then it says this, take that index card. Talk about what makes each person in the room unique. And be sure that these are all positive and encouraging and write them on an index card for each person to keep. Then the end of it is something like this. Take the pizzas out of the oven and enjoy them. Afterwards, read Psalm 139, 13 and 14 where it says that God has knit us together in our mother's womb. And we praise him because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. If you want to add a little bit of creativity, if you got grandkids, maybe you should have a little contest like most, most creative pizza. Uh, here's the pizza that won with the most toppings on it. Here's a pizza that had the most veggies. But thank God for the opportunity to be together and use that as an opportunity. That's just one little idea. It's taking a pizza-making activity and it's pointing, it's giving a little bit of access for a God truth moment to take place. The great thing about these is there is a variety of resources and out in the lobby, we have some of those up today. It's not completely done. We're waiting for a few more things, but throughout the different years, uh, throughout the year, we're going to be trading those different things out. And so there's going to be fresh idea cards and different pointers. Um, and the other great thing is it is not limited to the lobby. This is also completely available online. So if you go to our website and you click on the resource tab, there's a button that says Hope at Home and all of these resources are available. So Hope at Home can be on the go. I uh, want you to know that uh, um, Emily, Emily is very responsible for this transforming take place. And uh, in addition to a lot of activities with kids this summer that, that she and Heidi have been a part of, she and Heidi have been working very hard at, at the development of this. And this is a resource that came from a church in Texas. And uh, we have bought into it. And they give us seasonal things to be a part of. And 
it is so easy to miss the opportunity for planting a little seed. Truthfully, I'm a dad who probably went overboard sometimes, maybe, maybe a little bit pushy. But there's some people who don't even take that first little step and they miss that little, little, little tiny step, okay? Let's pray together.